Hey guys, welcome back to the vlog. Well, today we're gonna be doing a video that I'm not too proud of. But as I told you guys, when I started this channel, that is gonna be truth, 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 truth. And you gotta take the good truth with the bad truth. I mean, I mean, this is not really bad truth, but this is a clear example how power corrupts. It corrupts. And within a year, in less than a year of working with the DEA, I learned that I was pretty much above, above the law. I was carrying guns, doing cocaine, transporting cocaine, transporting money, doing all this illegal stuff uh, with the shield that I was working for law enforcement, which I was. I was. We had, we had certain rules that every time I was in a car with, a co with cocaine, I would have to beep them with a certain code and, and um, let them know that I was there. But I was literally above the law. I, I was a convicted felon carrying guns, handguns, and no matter what I did, I drove 160 miles an hour in my Porsche, got pulled over, they took my license away. They would go to a motor vehicle, would fill out some form and get me a phony name, a phony driver's license. There are all these things and imagine being on cocaine, drinking, and thinking you're a friggin' Miami Vice star. Except this is real. This was real. So I'm going to tell a story that's kind of unbelievable, but it's true. And I did a stupid thing, but I made a lot of money. And so the story goes like this. Um, every time that I would work in Miami because I was registered out of the New York office on 57th Street. And, uh, but every time I went to uh, Miami, which was frequent, we would go back and forth doing all kinds of coke deals and shit. And so, but every time I went, at least one of the two guys that handled me, which was Tom Slovanke and Jerome Jerry Becker, would have to assist, go down with me. Sort of like supervise me, but they didn't. Every time they went to Miami, they was having a vacation and I was, I was allowed to roam without a leash on, like a dog. Like, and I just did whatever I wanted to and uh, it was like uh, the greatest time of my life. So on one of these occasions, we went down to do one thing and they, they, did, they executed a search warrant, which is in my last video, you'll understand. Now, the DEA is not, you know, they, they like locking up people, but they're just as happy with uh, doing seizures, seizing drug dealers, money, property, cars, boats, house. They love to do that. And they're the only law enforcement agency that does that. They, they, they don't care. So um, that's what we were doing. And then all of a sudden, I met this idiot that knew... We, I, we both knew this one drug dealer. We both knew him, right? But he didn't know where he lived. We both knew the guy. And the guy had five kilos that he had to get rid of. He had a, he had a debt problem or whatever. He had to get rid of it. So now I'm down there with Tom and Jerry, like the cartoon, Tom and Jerry. And um, I have my Porsche, but I usually kept my Porsche down in Miami, and Tom and Jerry and I would just fly back to uh, back and forth on a, on Delta. We used to always land in uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport. They had a thing, had a contract with Delta, and I got my tickets for free. So anyway, so we're down there. They're finishing up a seizure, and all of a sudden, this case comes up out of the blue, and it was at nighttime. And so I said, um, I'm steering this guy to this other guy. And um, it's five kilos and we can pop them, just arrest them, I, I don't care. So, of course, we both knew this guy, but he didn't know where he left, lived. So I looked around, found the house that was for sale, a block from the beach, pulled the for sale sign out, threw it on the ground, and that's where we were gonna do this deal. So when we get into the car, I tell the guy, I don't, know, I don't know why I did this. He had the five kilos. I said, okay, Hector, whatever his name is, he wants 
three, and then I got another guy that wants the other two. So now he's got the cocaine in the standard Colombian canvas, black canvas gym bag. He's got the five kilos. He's got $12,000 in cash. And he's got his Motorola 8000 cell phone. So for all you people that don't know what that is, look at it right here. This was the bomb back in the 80s. It was, um, and look at the antenna one, and I'll tell you, tell you another story about the antenna. So that phone was $3,000. And he also had his Louis Vuitton suitcase, which, believe it or not, after 30 some odd years, I still got it. <laughs> this bag was $4,600 back in the day. And he had another one. He had another gym bag, Louis Vuitton gym bag with his clothes and stuff. Because right after we did the deal, he and I were going back to New York. We we're going to fly back to New York. I knew he was never getting on that flight. So anyway, uh, I pull up to the location where he thinks this mutual friend of ours is living. It had a long walkway. And now I got, this was like done like really fast. The DEA didn't have time to get enough men together. And don't forget, they don't, the, my DEA agents don't work out of the Miami office, or I think it was Fort Lauderdale at the time they had the office. They, they, so they had to get a bunch of guys together. They got ATF, US Customs, and I think a couple of FDL cops too. And so they, they put this team together real quick. So the plan was that I'm gonna pull up to this house that had a long walkway from the curb, which really, there was no curb. There was a bunch of beach sand, a bunch of beach sand. And um, once he got halfway uh, from that car to the house, the arrest signal was, I put my sunglasses on and they come in. And as they come in behind me, I take off. Well, the guy, the one guy, I don't know who he was, so they come from behind and they come from beside and he hits the brakes and he slides and he really does block me in. Meanwhile, there's like 10 guys running after this guy. He's trapped, they tackle him down. And now I, I had to tell the guy, back up, back up. So he backs up. I don't know if he saw that or not, but anyway, he wound up being a cooperating witness anyway. So he wasn't telling anybody. So they back up and I get away. Well, hell, now I have two kilos of cocaine $12,000 in cash, the luggage, his clothes, which really didn't fit me. So I take off, I go back to his apartment. He's in custody for three kilos. And uh, they take him back. And now I got two kilos, which I know I can drop for, I think at that time in New York, they were going for him. 23, 24,000. So I had like, I had $50,000 worth of drugs. Easy, easy. Plus all this stuff, plus the cell phone. <laughs> Holy shit. So I'm thinking, hey, this is my seizure. Why not, Kevin? And of course I was doing blow and I'm going, yeah, fuck it. Just fucking take it. They, nobody knows about it. And he, he certainly ain't going to tell him I had five kilos, okay, when he, when he just got popped with three. So... I get back to the, uh, the, the uh, underground garage in his apartment building where I, I know there's no surveillance, they're not there. And now I got all of this stuff. I got the cocaine and I said, F it. I'm gonna take it home. I'm gonna carry it on. I'm, I'm gonna take my brand new Louis Vuitton duffel bag. Not this one, but the little one. That one has two kilos and a Motorola 8,000 phone. Now that phone weighed two and a half pounds. It was called the brick. And of course, cocaine is 2.2 pounds per kilo. So you're talking about five, so eight, eight pounds, eight, eight pounds. Now, me and the DEA agents, we would often share hotel rooms when we would go down and back. So they always knew I traveled light. The one guy, he would always have his, his cologne. He'd bring all his shit down for a three day stay. And I, I, I was always traveling light. Remember, I always traveled light. So now half the bag, half the gym bag, and it was about this big, about this big, 
Half the gym bag is filled with some of my clothes and toiletries, and the rest of it was all the cocaine. So um, now, because of that arrest, I'm thinking these guys are going to be there for like two days. I, I didn't think. So I take my gym bag, my cocaine, my stolen uh, Motorola 8000 phone, and I go to the airport. And I'm about to, and back in the old days, as long as you didn't carry on a bag, it didn't go through the x-ray machine, you checked your bag in, which it had a little lock on it, had a little gold lock on it. So I, I was walking to check my bag in, and I had a pee. I had a fucking pee. But I said, let me check the bag in, and then I was going to go pee. Wish I would have peed. So as I'm walking towards the counter with my, new, with my new Louis Vuitton bag, and don't forget, these guys know everything about me. So the first thing he so I hear, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. And I turn around and oh shit. Now I'm not gonna tell which agent it was. I did a video and I told what agent it was. And after thinking about it, I said, I better not tell it. Both of these agents are long retired. One of them, I believe, was a liaison officer for the German, federal German police. So I don't even know where he is in the world, but in the off chance, he sees this. So it was either one of them. It was either Tom or Jerry. Uh, it's Tom the cat or Jerry the mouse. I don't know which one is which. Which one is which? Who's the mouse? Who's the cat? I don't know. So I got the Coke and the bag, and he doesn't recognize that bag. And this is a well-trained DEA agent. And one that knows me. I've been working with him for two years. So he goes, what are you, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going home. I, what are you doing? Aren't you? Oh, no, we, I have another case. I had to go. And the other agent is going to take care of that arrest and write that up. I says, okay. He says, um, what flight are you? And uh, flight 126? I said, oh, no, I'm on 126. Come on, let's go. He says, hey, would you get a new bag? <laughs> right away. I said, yeah, I thought I'd treat myself for the money that I'm going to be making on this next pop. And he looked at me a little funny. So now, let me educate you guys about what happens when law enforcement gets on board a commercial flight. There's actually two things that are happening. First of all, they identi identify themselves as a federal agent and um, they fill out a form. And then what happens is they board the plane first. Now, depending on the pilot, the captain, he will determine whether or not he's going to allow you to carry your gun in flight. He can either take it into the pilot's uh, room and lock it up, or he can let you carry it on. And most Delta pilots let law enforcement carry their weapons on, but then they seat you. They, 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 it's up to the captain whether or not they want you in the front, in the back, in the middle, and they usually put us in the back. We stay in the back. So now I got this fucking thing and I'm going, oh, and I've, I, and I've flew with these guys many times. So I know they don't go through the scanner. They don't go through the metal detector because they do have a gun, right? So um, in this case, the pilot said, yes, you can carry your gun. I want you in the last row of, of the plane in the back. So we go, he's behind me and I could just feel him staring at that bag. I, I could just feel him staring at the bag. I get to the back of the plane, like right where the restroom is. I open up the, the bin and I throw my, my bag in. He comes and he's got this big shit and he, he's got all his equipment and body armor and, and he tries to put it in and close the door and it won't close. So now he takes my bag and he lifts it up and he puts his in first and he goes what the f he goes, what do you got in here three keys and i go no two i can't i couldn't believe i said that i couldn't believe it and he just looked at me knowing so now don't forget my bag is like eight pounds overweight between the cell phone and the two kilos and he goes and he looks at me funny then he puts it up and closes the door 
and I have the window seat. There's three seats. One seat was empty. They didn't see anybody there with us. So now, the flight from Fort Lauderdale to JFK is two and a half hours. And remember when I had to pee? Well, now, I have to, now I have to really pee. So halfway in, into the flight, you know, when he, he, when he first, let's back up. When he first sits down, he was giving me a funny look and he's thinking, where the hell did he get? And of course he knows how much that bag costs. He, he knows, he goes, where the hell did he get that from? There was just an arrest. Uh, you know, he, he, he's thinking, and I'm trying to talk to him to break up his concentration. And he, he was just zoned out. So I go, fuck, he knows, he knows. Uh, he, he knows I did something. He, he, he knows because I'm sure my eyes were, I was <laughs> shitting in my pants. <laughs> Get the coke. He's a DEA agent and we're flying back to New York. We didn't go through any checkpoints. We, I'm on the plane with the dope. And so uh, halfway through, I could pee. I had to pee so bad, I could taste it. But I didn't dare get up to go to the bathroom because I knew the second I went into that bathroom, he would go and unzip it. And, I, and, and, and you know, I, I was just, I, or, or he would smell it. And let me tell you about this one particular agent. He was so good. Like when I was around Coke, he could smell it on my hands. He, he, he was like a dog. He could smell it. I was like, oh fuck. Even though it's got the little lock on it, I'm thinking he's gonna smell it or he's gonna wear, he's gonna, oh yeah. All he had to do is feel. All he had to do was feel and they were two bricks. He knows what that is. So I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. And of course, so in that anyway, so now we land. And of course he gets right up, opens up the thing. And of course he's got to, hand me my bag because he can't get to his now. So he hands me the bag and he like sort of threw it at me and gave me a look. He gave me a fucking look. So I'm thinking maybe he thinks it's just my gun. Maybe he, cause they know they didn't want me to take my gun. And you could, you could travel with guns back then. Back then, as long as you put them on carry on, you can go through the machine. So anyway, we land. And now I have the guy that's going to buy this cocaine picking me up. Holy crap. Is he going to know this guy? So as we get off the plane, I said, I got to go to the bathroom real bad. So I took my bag and I went, I'll call you in the morning. And I went in and I really did. I had to go to the bathroom. I mean, I don't think I pissed. It, I was there for like five minutes peeing. I, had, I mean, I, I was like in pain. So now I come out in JFK and I'm going, where the fuck is he? I can't allow him to see me get into a car of a known drug dealer because he'll, I don't know where he is now. So I walked right past the guy. I said, don't look at me, don't talk to me. And I grabbed the cab, took off, went home. Next day, sold it. So let's see how much I made that day. So it was a bad thing to do, but I did it and I never did it again. And thank God for the statute of limitations. So let's see, let's add this up. 2000 for the gym bag. We're going to make a little, uh, add this up 2000 for the gym bag, 3000 for the phone. I think I got 44,000 for the cocaine. Um, did I say 4,600 for the Louis Vuitton? No, no. Louis, did I show you guys the Louis Vuitton? Did I show them? I don't know if I show it to you, but this is the actual bag that I've had 30 something years. This was the bag that I have left. So anyway, I edited it all up. Plus I got $3,000 for the three kilos that were seized in Miami. Plus I think I got 3000 for the body because they actually arrested somebody. And so um, I think that was the beginning of what ruined my marriage. And um, you can't give someone a license to run wild in the streets like I was. And it took its toll on me. It almost got me killed several times. And um, I won't get into that any, any more because now I'm going to start telling you guys all the cool stories that followed. Uh, but that was one time when I failed. I failed. I, and later on in life when I found out what damaged cocaine could do. I felt terrible that I put two kilos of cocaine on the street. But anyway, 
I went to confession, and what else could I do? But I wanted to tell you guys that I am human, and that, you know, I made that mistake, and now for the first time ever, I'm, I'm telling this story. So I hope you guys enjoyed it, and we got, we're going to be on the DEA theme right now, and uh, we'll even get to some of the DEA cases that I worked um, uh, for Danielle Staub to get her her probation. We're going to look at those too. So um, thanks again for you guys that have been subscribing. And for all of those of you that haven't, push the button, guy. Come on. All right. Thank you so much, and God bless. Peace out. Mwah.